for Matt Allen, uh, based in Melbourne. We're going to chat to him in a minute. And uh, so we're really excited because basically we got connected with him on uh, Twitter, right? So basically Twitter, we don't get a lot of views uh, and we're fine with that. But what we do get is a lot of really great contacts. And so there's a couple in the works that have come from uh, just some interactions on Twitter. So Matt Allen's based in uh, Melbourne, originally was from Sydney, and he runs uh, a company called Tractor Ventures, which we originally assumed was uh, just a standard venture fund, uh, but it does actually differ a little bit. So we're going to chat about the differences, chat a little bit about venture and uh, talk about the startup um, environment here in Australia uh, because it doesn't get a lot of airtime, I think. A lot of the you know common people around uh, in Australia don't really necessarily know how it works um, so much. And so we're going to chat about that. Uh, talk a bit about his uh, develop it, uh, development career uh, in software and uh, web development. And then, uh, yeah, should, uh, should be a great episode, I think. You excited? Yeah. We've got a couple of little icebreaker questions, maybe just to, to start. So, first question is: uh, Grinspoon or silver chair? Oh, uh, definitely Grinspoon. Okay. Um, <laughs> definitely, uh, you know, my that were really important. Oh, interesting enough, like yeah. so, um, silver chair's first song came out in '94, '95, and and it yeah. was definitely on high rotation during my HSC. Um, oh, true. In, okay. And I was driving around. I got my license. I got my car. I was doing my visa, my, my my HSC, and and um. Oh, wow. And that album came out, so that that's actually like it's giving me goosebumps. I'll just bring it back. That was very much my <laughs> my end of high school. However, I then was fairly involved with Grinspoon and did a lot of their first website. You know, really was, spent a bunch of time with them. You know, like I did it as a volunteer, and they're like, "How how, how do we how do we compensate you for this?" I'm like, "I'll take access all passes to oh. everywhere you go. Thank you very much." No so way. I was I was spent plenty of time behind the scenes at you know, a uh, home bake and a lot of their tours and, um, and they bought me my first digital camera. So I had a, a Kodak digital camera with an eight meg card in it that I'd go to the Annandale in, uh, in, in Sydney, take photos all night long, go home, upload them to their website. And that was kind of magical in, um, in, in the late nineties and early True. 2000s. Yeah, yeah. They would have thought you were a genius, <laughs> right? That's crazy. Okay. So, so you finished school in like 95 or something mm-hmm. like that, right? Okay. Yep. And then, and then, so, from what I could tell, you just like totally self-taught web developer, right? Correct. Okay, yep. crazy. So, is that because back then there wasn't a lot of formal structure around learning that stuff, or you just didn't really want to do that, or? Yeah, interesting. So, like, nineteen ninety three was when the, the first sort of web browser came out. Before then, the internet was not as much fun as it is today, and there wasn't a hell of a lot to look at, and it was all very sort of text based and ugly. And then, sort of Netscape. Mosaic came out in '93, so I decided to start sort of building building web stuff. Um, you know, when I was at school, um, and that to me was, you know, the way you learn that stuff was kind of copying and pasting your way to to modify modifying something till it worked. Yeah, uh, I did actually spend a semester at uni. I went oh, to cool. Wollongong Uni for one semester. It's not written down anywhere because it was one semester. And uh, it was a business computing course, yep. you know, where they were trying to tell me how to use a mouse. I'm like, I'm building the web. Um, oh, yeah. Like this is frustrating. Um, yeah. And I just sort of dropped out and decided that, wow. you know, the things they were trying to teach me were lagging. You know, things are moving so quickly in the industry that, you know, it's a, it's a challenge with all tertiary education, which is how do you, how do you teach on the edge of, yeah. of um of fast moving technology i think yeah. there is so many things uh so many careers that require you know base level big knowledge from tertiary education you know whether you're a doctor or a lawyer an engineer i don't want people building the, the you know the buildings we're in without knowing fundamentally why they're doing it um i think building websites and building technology yeah. hasn't necessarily got that um core foundational yeah. element to it all the time yeah. there are parts that absolutely do yeah. I, at that point in time, I did not feel that was the way it was. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and uh, and we noticed that um, your early startup. So uh, this is this was um, River Dynamics um, over here that you co-founded. Uh, yeah. Is that is that kind of how you cut your teeth as a um, as an entrepreneur and how you kind of learned the original founder skills and uh, and is that and what is yeah. River yeah. Dynamics? Yeah, and what yeah. What, uh, and what, well, <laughs> that, so um, there's actually a tie into your there. So um, oh, cool. uh, I got I got an email from. Uh, uh, who became my co-founder? His name was Doug, and uh, his wife was very much into Australian music. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, down the bottom of the um of the the Grinson website, it's like this website is built by Matt. You know, he's a link off to to my website or my email. I can't remember. And he sent me an email saying, "Hey, I've got this idea. Could you build this thing for me?" And he was um, working in the insurance industry, yeah. um, and he was receiving work on on the supplying insurance companies on the claim side of things. So you know, you make a claim, and there's a bunch of providers that provide stuff to do with claims and he's like this is a really inefficient process and i feel like it should be able to be created into some sort of automation or something can you help me so um yeah so he found me because his wife clicked on a link on the website i mean you should talk to this guy he seems to be able to build websites and seems like you need a website um so yeah that that was river dynamics and and yes that was my first co-foundership i had run a hosting company with a friend and and hosted websites which was convenient because i was building websites and (laughs) hosting back in the day was a bit bit rudimentary um but yeah so that was my where i went yeah i can do that so yeah yeah yeah. cto and tech co-founder i'm like yeah i can build anything just you know tell me what you need to build and we'll go off and build it and we built it and we sold it. You know, we had some new, awesome. new um, investors and directors come along who were sort of ex IBM sales guys and went, "Oh, this seems to be working well. We can, wow. we can sell this thing." So they did, and by that time, it was about five years in. And Doug and I were both pretty tired, and we were just like, "Well, do you guys just want to buy an office?" And they bought an office, and we went out. Wow. Right, anyways, um, interestingly enough, I have done two other co- the two other um, yep. uh, startups with Doug, my original yep. founder. Oh wow! Uh, so we did another one together, which lasted a year. We bootstrapped; it didn't quite work. But the yep. current one. He is the technical co-founder, so he writes all the code and really? deals with it, and I'm just the passive investor now. So I, I invested in the company. That was called managedfunctions.com. Okay. So okay. they're still in the insurance company, it's still wow. in the insurance industry, wow. but he's literally built an amazing platform on top of the AWS cloud. Yeah. Um, and he, again, self-taught himself as well. So oh, there's something so cool. there. Yeah, yeah, great, and um, and so we actually uh, so listening to um to your Tractor Ventures podcast there. Yes, um, hard we actually mode. yeah, hard mode. Yeah, um, we uh, we came across some um, Claimer, which seems like another similar um, business model. Is that um is that one one of the ones in your portfolio, or is that just an interesting co- uh, an interesting founder that you guys liked? Or um... no, 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 Claimo is a is a Tractor um Tractor Ventures portfolio company. Yeah, yep. so Nathan yep. and and his wife um from Claimo um realized that there was a bunch of um, basically illegal insurance sold to people bundled up inside mortgages and other kinds of um, uh, loans. Yeah. And uh, there was a Royal, Royal Commission that went, yep, this is definitely illegal. And all the banks went, oh, crap. Uh, yeah. We've got billions of dollars worth of wow. exposure here. And Nath was actually in part of the like the, the legal side to understand how that stuff works. So he's like, I'm going to help people. Yeah. understand whether or not they got sold this junk insurance which is like a it's like almost like an opt-out tick box when you got a yeah. loan or whatever and people didn't do it so they they paid for it it was rolled up into their you know onboarding costs and and it turns out they get heaps of money back for just regular people that were basically screwed by this thing um, yeah, yeah yeah and it, it basically claims management um uh, business you know they, they need to interact with the lender and the lender needs to dig out their records from 2007 and go yeah. yep we screwed up sorry about that and then pay them out yeah, wow. Okay, crazy. Okay, so then the next thing that I, that we could find that I think is maybe a highlight is uh, you go from, I assume, maybe selling this business and then, uh, which was the River Dynamics, and then you move into what seems to be a role at uh, a website called I Seek Golf. Is that right? Mm, yeah. And so that's still potentially like the largest golfing website in Australia, right? It, it, it was at the time. I don't know if it is at the moment, um, okay. but it was definitely a, um, it was actually, a, you know, it all, this is a lesson in um, longevity of relationships. So I, I used to host I Sit Golf on my hosting company. Yeah, right. And I knew the founder, Jason. Yeah. And one day he said to me, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to hire a software developer. You know, I, it's time to sort of make this thing better. And I, I kind of taught him to code PHP. Like I'd been coding PHP for Greenspoon yeah. and so forth and River Dynamics and taught him that. But he wasn't really a developer. He's like, it's time. I need a developer. I'm like, well, can I do it? He's like, that's great. So I lived in the country at the time. We moved to the country after we solved River Dynamics. Um, and we, but he was also, Jace is also a, um, a bit of a, a, like a technologist. He was all, always reading TechCrunch and, and all the new things. And he went, yeah. there's this thing called Ruby on Rails. Um, I've mucked around with it. I think we should re, rebuild eight years of IC Golf in nasty PHP that he'd been doing into a nice, shiny new Rails website. Yeah. So I went, yeah, I can do that. So I went from PHP to Ruby, 
yeah. via Ruby on Rails, yeah. um, which is also the start of a long relationship with the Ruby community for me. I ended up being the treasurer and the president and ran around Ruby comps and ran the Sydney Ruby meetup and the Melbourne Ruby meetup. So, wow. um, you know, that one decision was a pretty impactful one for me. Wow. It seems like everything you're saying intertwined throughout all of it is just the importance of like relationships, right? Yeah. And it seems like something you're naturally quite good at, I'm assuming. Um, and so a question about Ruby since you brought it up. So as you said, you're the president and then later the treasurer. Um, but in your time, uh, they did like uh, Ruby Rails camps, right? And mm-hmm. then so there was a camp you went to and I think I was reading online somewhere. There was a camp you went to and you met these guys who had, again, who had an idea and I think needed just basically some direction business-wise. And then it turned out to be some massive uh, business school. I think it's called Build Kite now, right? Yep. Could you That's expand it. on that a little bit? Yeah, so... Um, I was part of the Ruby community, you know, was learning. This was 2006. Yeah. Um, it was really early. Like Ruby, Ruby on Rails was like pre 1.0. So it wasn't even like a, a, a proper release. It was very much beta software. And we're like, screw it. We're going to build it. We're going to deploy IC Golf onto Ruby on Rails 0. Point something, you know. Yeah. And it was a bit of a shit show because, <laughs> it's, you know, it's not really ready for consumption yet, right? So, like, we're, we're learning. Everything's changing. We're learning. Um and I needed this community. So I, and I was living in Goulburn in New South Wales or living just near Goulburn on, on our farm. So yeah. I'd go to Sydney every month to go to the meetup, mostly to hang out with people and ask questions. I'm like, hey, this thing keeps breaking. What are we going to do? Yeah. Um, you mentioned Rails Camp. So, yes, we we did the, a four-day um, four off-site effectively twice a year, Friday through to sort of Monday morning. Um, and th- we did those twice a year for a long – I think I went to 21 in a row um, – um, and it was just that they were amazing from building up this this um, uh, community, um, it's offline community, online oh, and online community. Um, yeah, so I met a bunch of people who were still some of my best friends there, and um, and Keith and Tim from Bill Kite, um, you mentioned. So yeah. uh, Keith was working at Envato, Tim was working at Pin Payments, and Keith had solved a problem for Envato and said, "I think it's time to you know you know how do you build a business, Matt?" I'd sort of got this persona of I, I was a reluctant software developer for a long time. Like I'm not, yeah, right. you know, an attention to details guy. I'm not, I'm self-taught, you know, I'm not yeah. an engineer. I would never, ever call myself an engineer yeah. because to do that, you need to go to uni and you need to have a degree. <laughs> yeah. and it's up on the, the wall behind you, right? So, hey, look, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm right. not that guy. I'm not that guy. Let's be clear. But I had, you know, I I'd started doing some investing and sort of had this, sort of moving out of technology into a post-technical kind of life, I guess, if you will. Mm-hmm. I also became a tech recruiter, so I sort of flipped mm-hmm. up to helping found, um, helping uh, software developers, you know, incre- improve their their careers. Yeah. So Keith Kennedy said, how do you even do a business? You know, like, <laughs> well, what, what do we need to do to make this thing? You know, I'd love to be able to do this full time. I've got, you know, him, Tim and I have these jobs, but we'd love to do it. I'm like, well, you probably need a little bit of capital. You probably need someone to help you. Yeah. I could do that. So we, we, we raised a little bit of money for them from um, a couple of exited founders plus basically our friends who were also their customers. They were all CTOs and, and, yeah. and mates who used the software, you know, in anger. Yeah. So we did that and um, they were able to quit their jobs and, and you know, it's now a 30-person company um, yeah. with some of the biggest software yeah. companies in the world as their customers. And I saw it's Shopify really... on there and, and a couple of massive, like I think uh, Discord was on there and Venmo, like some massive customers. So yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like they, they solve, they solve software deployment at scale for really big enterprise teams. Yeah, like, like Shopify has something like, is it 3000 software developers building Shopify.com at any point in time? That's and, yeah. and, and the, the, the systems you use to, build software at scale like that, most of the other ones just fall apart, but this one doesn't. So Bill Card is um is definitely uh one of my biggest um and and most exciting things in in my um portfolio. Yeah, I'd agree. That's awesome. So I noticed um when we were looking through uh sort of like the theme of the type of companies that you seem to be just involved in, whether it's at an investment level or a founder level or advisory or whatever. There sort of seems to be a theme apart from a couple that I could tell. And so um, other than a company called What Cost and Spaceship Financial, um, which I think uh, What Cost, I think maybe you co-founded and it was like this little product that helped people monitor their electricity usage, which is really cool. Um, And the other one, Spaceship Financial, which seems to be sort of like an app where people can jump into portfolios based on tech companies. Um, All the other ones seem to be uh, sort of underlying technology that help businesses do what they do. So you're not sort of like... Uh, like speculating on a particular platform to be the next Instagram 
or the next product that's going to go viral um, or anything like that, you're investing in uh, like underlying technologies. And so uh, it reminded me of a quote by a guy named Mark Twain, which talks about uh, sort of making the picks and shovels in the gold rush as opposed to going out and trying to find the gold and, and investing speculatively. Mm-hmm. Is that true? Do you have any thoughts around that kind of concept? Is yeah. that intentional? Well, tr- Tr- um, Tractor Ventures was originally called Pick and Shovel Ventures, so oh, you've right. nailed it. <laughs> oh, true. So I don't know. I don't know whether or not that was a, uh, a, a you know, literally called Pick and Shovel Ventures. Right. Uh, and I have Pick and Shovel, Pick and Shovel dot Ventures. I think. Um, oh, yeah. And that, okay. that was it. So, so yes, it's true. Um, okay. You know, the other way to phrase that is we really like even at Tractor. Yeah. We're ha- fans of kind of boring B two B software. Like it's it's <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's it's. Um, you know, the premise of Tractor is is that um, there's a bunch of companies, a bunch of people out there who need uh, software in their lives that just sort of sit there and get the job done. You know, we can always build a nice, shiny Instagram and all that. I'm not a huge fan of B2C stuff because, yeah. you know, consumers are notoriously tight and fickle um, where businesses, you know, you can prove you're going to save them money or save them time or both. And mm-hmm. they're like, just just take my money and make sure that it gets better over time. Um, I do like that space. Uh, so, yeah, you've known it. I, I do. I, I, it is a it is a philosophy of mine that is, if you can become a mission critical, even in a niche, especially tractor um, founders who are not necessarily building the rockets that the VCs love. Like even if you service a niche which looks small, it's probably still going to be big enough if you get it right. So it becomes really impactful. Yeah, right. That's that's really interesting. So then we noticed that. Okay, so moving on a little bit further now. Um, so we get to somewhere around 2017. And you start becoming involved with an accelerator called Startmate, right? Um, and so I think originally as a, I think as a mentor, right? Could you yep. talk a little bit about, I guess maybe generally for people who have no idea, which is probably a lot of people, what is an accelerator and what kind of companies would utilize it and benefit from it? And then how does it actually look in Australia versus potentially America? Could you talk about that? And then maybe some of your experience? Yeah, sure. So an accelerator is a, is a time-bound um, uh, it's basically a couple's uh, an investment into the company and a time bound, usually around three months worth of assistance mm-hmm. to literally accelerate that business from where it was to where it wants to be. Yeah. And usually what happens on the back of an accelerator program is the founders would then go on to raise their next round of capital. So right. most of the time the founders are on a VC trajectory or a venture capital trajectory. Yeah. Um, you know, the most well-known one in the States is um, Y Combinator. Uh, there's also yes. one called Techstars here in Australia, the Startmate. Um, Techstars is in Australia as well. Uh, so I joined as a mentor. Most of the mentors are um, founders or exited founders. So they, there's, there's a bunch of help you get from the community. Plus, in Startmate, it's mentor back. So all the money comes from the mentors. And then we, ah. we choose a cohort of whatever, 10 to 15. Oh, out you, get, of the you guys get to choose it. Wow. That's cool. Well, there's a process. There's yeah, yeah. The, team, the Startmate team runs it, but there's a process of elimination, if you will. And you sort of bubble it down to the top N, where N is 10 to 15, depending on whatever. And then those are the ones that go into the program, which sort of pop out the end um, yeah. in three or four months' time. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's, I started there, um, and, and the reason I started with Startmate in 2017 is I'd been working as a scout um, for Blackbird, which is one of the, the earliest modern investment, VC investment companies here in Australia. Yeah. Um, their fund, their 2012 fund, um, and they didn't have anybody in Melbourne, um, and they put together a program to help. There was a handful, it was six of us that were kind of scouting for deals for them, um, Five of them were founders I'd invested in, and me because I I don't know I, I was I was hassling Nicky a lot on Twitter, and he <laughs> came and visited me one day and said, "Hey, do you want to help us find some cool. founders to invest in?" I'm like, "That sounds like a great idea." But yeah. then um, they then hired um, the, a partner called Nick uh, Crocker, who who is based in Melbourne. Yeah. So like, hey, we're gonna we're not doing this scout program thing anymore, yeah. but what did go do start, mate? So that's sort of how I became involved there. Yeah. yeah, right. And is that something that's um, so? Yeah, we've seen we've seen like incubators um, and accelerators as well. So, um, is there is there any room for the kind of? And I guess I guess you can probably mesh them both into and call them accelerator anyway. Um, mm. But uh, but yeah, do you um, do you have any room for uh, the idea generation side, or is it more um, scouting those scouting those ideas initially? 
it's a it's a little bit of a, a function of time for me. So um, yeah. I used to run a thing called Founder Institute, which is an, an incubator. Like this is like come to us when you've got some ideas and over the period of the course you whittle it down to one and then you'll improve that one to the point where it's right at the beginning. Gotcha. So an incubator is a little bit like I think I might know what I want to do, but I'm not quite sure. An accelerator is like I've got this thing and I want to go fast and I want to Great. I want to like double down on it to, to like I've already come with my idea and I need to accelerate first I've got some ideas and I need to whittle it down and then sort of get to the point where I might go into an incubator so um, and for me as 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 my portfolio grows and and the 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 older companies become the younger companies become older companies and they they get big and and interesting um personally for me I don't have as much time for the hey I've got 10 ideas can you help me find the best one it's just, it's just a like my skill set is more applicable to fewer more advanced, um, kind of, and also because I do because I'm leading tractor, you know, I sort of point the absolute vast majority of my time into the tractor portfolio, yeah. which are all at more advanced companies, and that's sort of you know more yeah. applicable nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and um, and we saw that uh, that you spent a little bit of time with um with AWS. Um, did you uh, did you get to meet Jeff? And uh, <laughs> and what was the whole process like there? I didn't meet Jeff. I did walk <laughs> past his office one day, I think, or at oh, least close cool. to it, um, over in Seattle. Nice. Yep. Um, AWS. I was on the startup and venture capital team. So when we that's a global team. So we um we reported up to APAC via Singapore up in Seattle. Um, when I joined. I think there was 83 of us globally, um, three of us in Australia. Yeah. Um, and when I left, I think it was 300 globally on that team. Uh, so it was it was a lot of fun. Um, you know, I was trying to solve for one main problem, which was I've been self-employed for basically my whole career. I'm like, well, I'll get a job. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> I, I, did, I did get a job. Um, and it turns out that that job, as far as jobs go, um, was a pretty awesome one. Yeah, um, yeah. It was in business development. I didn't have to sell anything. Yeah. Uh, I just got to help founders all day long. I got to hang out with VCs because, yeah. you know, my job was to look after their portfolio. Um, I got to travel the world uh, and, and meet up with my team around the world. We had offsites in Bali and New York and prior to me getting there, that was Japan and all over the place. So like, as far as, yeah, it was, it was rough. Uh, and I got paid it. I got paid a shitload of Bezos bucks and got some Amazon shares. So, like, <laughs> as far awesome. as jobs go, it was, a, it was a good one. That's cool. That's a great little moment in your life, I suppose. Bezos bucks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <That's> great. <laughs> um, okay, so question. First one's a uh, silly question. Um, so, uh, as we said, mostly picks and shovels. A couple of um, consumer products. And one that we, I didn't mention before is a product called detoxbox.io. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, <laughs> um, my question around that is... Uh, and the serious question now is, uh, I guess a lot of what you do is building relationships and stuff like that. We said that before. Uh, and then now in today's world, that's obviously mostly online or a portion of it's online. And that's using social media and stuff like that. I guess what's your thoughts around, uh, have you, what's your thoughts around balancing using it as a tool, social media, sort of using it as a tool to, to meet people, you know, connect with us, which was awesome and stuff like that. And actually it just sort of controlling your life a little bit too much. Because I think it's something everyone deals with and it's something that you have, like you don't have any choice but to use these platforms and meet people and stuff. Have you got any tips or any thoughts around that concept? Yeah, it's, it's an interesting conversation having just taken a week offline uh, in January um, yeah, right. okay. on an island in Queensland and being, you know, completely offline. Um, oh, wow. I think um, for me, um, this sort of comes in ebbs and flows. Like I know it's a tool that I need yeah. to be present on and engage with. It's not just being present, it's actually engaging, which to be clear is pretty tiring. Um, however, without it, I wouldn't be where I am. So it is it's like it's, it's, a, it's a bit of a love-hate thing because, yeah. you know, engagement requires time and time you need to choose where you get it from and what you're yeah. not doing when you are doing that. Yeah. Um, I have this conversation with my wife all the time, like yeah. what happens when I don't need it as a tool anymore? So, yeah. you know, if I pop out, if I, in five years time, I don't need, you know, I don't need to yeah. talk to founders all day long anymore because that's not what I do. Yeah. Like, am I still there? I don't know. I mean, I really enjoyed being offline and not having the burden yeah. of having to stay on, you stay current. Yeah. Um, I, I do, however, think it does democratize access. Like yeah. I talk to some really, really interesting people. Yeah. You know, I have lots of conversations with billionaires because, yeah. you know, I, I've done enough engagement with them at a 
respectful level so that when you ask them a question, they'll give you an answer. Like yeah. you can't walk up to these people in the street and do that. So, you know, there's a, there's an argument there that if if you want to learn a bunch of stuff, it's really good. You need to filter pretty heavily and remove the noise. Um, yeah. And, you know, also be mindful that the signal that you double down on yeah. will be the signal that you start identifying with. So just be careful, yeah. right? Like just yeah. you really need to be careful about about who you do that. And I mean, I got into investing because I decided one day, I'm like, oh, I think I want to be an investor. How do I do that? I'll follow a bunch of investors. When they yeah. say stuff, I ask them questions and become curious yeah. and become curious with, I okay, got enough background so you're not asking numpty questions all the time and you're trying to add a little bit of value and ask a question at the same time. Yeah. And, you know, I engage with all kinds of people who ask me lots of questions and stuff. And I, I try and keep it positive. I've certainly removed a bunch of negative, negative people from my list and stuff like that. So yeah. I think it's really important to, to, to come back to your question. Like you need to master it. Yeah, um, otherwise, yeah. it will master you and yeah. it won't be fun. Yeah, that's right. And I guess that awareness is is the first step to doing that. Um, so you said you had a, like a week off the grid. Is that like a is that like a build think week sort of thing? Is that I've done that before. That, uh, yeah, I did yeah. do that um, uh, before I started Tractor, which was delightful. Um, ah, okay. No, this one was our twentieth um, wedding anniversary. So oh, uh, congrats! Amazing. We went to an island off Townsville in Queensland, yeah. um, and it was just delightful. Yeah, right. Okay, crazy. So, yeah, okay, that's a good point. So, we noticed that um, when you finish at AWS, which is sort of like mid to late um, 2019, there's sort of a period of time where there's it's sort of there's not a, th- a thousand things happening like the rest of your life. And so, yeah, it, was that a moment of thought? Obviously, COVID's happening. You know, you're locked down for 120 days or whatever in Melbourne. And um, is, was that a moment of just like reconsidering values and, and what's important and what you want to do? Is that what happened there? Sort yeah, of? it correlated with... A couple of um, exits correlated with some 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 returns on our investment, um, which we were lucky enough to be able to, um, you know, not have to earn the Bezos bucks um, for for a while. Yeah, it's awesome. Which gave me enough time to sit on the couch and consider what's next. Um, and I did that, and then COVID came along, and um, I just started yelling at people on Twitter from doing dumb shit and not taking it seriously, um, which made April go, like, you've got to find something to do. Like, you can't just yell at people on Twitter all day long. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and um, you know, Track Adventures or Pick and Shovel Adventures, as it was back then, yeah. was something that um, I'd been thinking about for a long time. It actually existed prior to my job at AWS. So I was trying to build a fund called Pick and Shovel Ventures oh, right. with a couple of mates of mine. Uh, we realized that we were, none of us were in a position to run a small fund because with small fund becomes small fees and small fees is small salaries. And we had families and mortgages and things like that. So we're like, oh, that ain't going to work. So yeah. one of them went off to Bill Kite and the other one came with me to AWS. And we sort of spent two or three years doing that. And now we're off doing other stuff. But um, um, yeah, the, the time there was, as I said, um, lucky enough to not have to um, pay the bills for a while and, yeah. and take some time out. And it's probably the first time, as you can see from my LinkedIn, that I'd stopped for yeah. about 20 yeah, five really years. Yeah, I it. Yeah. And, um, and, and take stock. And, and, you know, at that point, I guess I was in my early 40s um, and figuring out whether or not I can just sustain that pace for a long time. And the answer is yeah. I don't think I can. No. Nah. So how do I optimize for fewer better yeah. is, is sort of where I ended up. So that's how do I do fewer things yeah, that's smart. but be more impactful with them, yeah. um, which I've managed to do now. You know, I don't do a lot of advisory. I only do – there's only a hand. There's like – there's a handful of things I do today. Yeah. And I think I do them much better than how do I spread myself too thin prior. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so um, so moving moving on more towards the um, the portfolio side um, yeah. of the uh, of the VC stuff. Um, so uh, we've got we've all, we've seen different kind of rules that work and don't work, um, and we've seen like Andreessen and and Y Combinator partners and all that stuff kind of say different things like mm. don't invest in married co-founders, do invest <laughs> in married co-founders, don't invest <laughs> in solo founders, do invest in you know. Co- so like there's there's all sorts of different um, rules. Do you have any specific, like, have you ever invested in a solo founder? Do you have any specific kind of rules that you stick to with your portfolio? Because you and your wife, obviously, and uh, I think Jody, uh, mm-hmm. founded Tractor, right? Yep. So that's an yeah, interesting so, dynamic in itself. Yeah, and, and there is a disproportionate number of life partners in the Tractor portfolio as well. That's cool. So that was not done on purpose. Okay. But 
you know, data, our data is suggesting that these people, you know, the VCs are like, there's that introduces a risk factor that we wouldn't have to deal with otherwise. Yeah. And that's one version of the same story. The other version of it is this guy, these, these people are committed to this thing and they can't just walk away from it because they're both in it, right? Like, yeah, it might create interesting dynamics in it, but arguably if they've been together for a while and they start a business, you know, April and I have been together for 20 years before we started Tractor. Yeah. Um, so, you know, blanket rules basically don't work full stop. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, and, it, and I think that, you know, it also creates an opportunity, right? So if every VC is like from Pat Match's perspective, we don't back married founders. Yeah. So what... what in, by default, you're going to have these bunch of businesses, which could be amazing, 100%. but they didn't even get past the first gate. So I'm looking at them going, right, oh, Nate from Claymo, you want to come and, you know, you, you need you need a certain type of sh- shape of capital and help to accelerate your business. Like, yeah. I don't have that rule, so yeah. how can we help? Okay. Um, yeah. So I guess it creates an opportunity on the other side of the coin. Um, you know, I'm happy for VCs to have their stupid blanket <laughs> rules and then and say no to a bunch of people that, <laughs> that technically create opportunity if you were able to look at it through the right lens. Yeah, I, I don't think many of them do have blanket rules. I mean, I think they pattern match pretty hard and pretty fast early. Um, but anyone who's curious enough, I mean, when it comes to VC, it really does come down to the person you're talking to at that firm, at a partner or an analyst. Yeah kind of leaning into what you do you know like it's very hard to get someone who to care about something that they just don't have any interest in right so it's you know you're like if you're pitching b to c technology about something to someone who just doesn't identify with that like it's it's likely they're pattern matching and wipe it away straight away yeah yeah i agree um okay so question is um and maybe this is uh a general question um for people who don't know, who don't understand um, the startup ecosystem, what do the stages of funding look like from someone coming up with an idea and how might they get their first capital in your experience and uh, all the way to potentially what might be the end goal, which might be an IPO or an acquisition? or what, what, do that, what does that look like usually? Yeah, like the traditional way is you kind yeah. of do a friends and family round, which right. is, you know, the people that are just going to give you money because they love you. Um, <laughs> You know, um, it's likely that, um, you know, they're not thinking about ownership stakes and how much of the company they get. They're not thinking about even what success looks like. Yeah. You know, they just want you to succeed. So, Would that be know, more of a loan, it, usually? Uh, no, a yeah. lot of the people, well. you know, some, some. I mean, it, it varies. It's all lots okay. of different shapes and sizes. But but a lot of the time you'll see it as a friends and family round where they they, they, they take equity. Um you know, the challenge a lot of the time with that is is that, you know, they're, they're very, very unsophisticated investors yeah. and they're the kind of ones that are likely to turn around in a year's time and go, I need my money back. And you're like, well, <laughs> that's hard. Uh, yeah. It's very hard, if not impossible, without annoying the rest of the shareholders now. Yeah. <laughs> so friends and family um, is enough to hopefully get to the point where, you know, you can create enough of a product to do like a seed round um, where – the seed round is probably beyond your friends and family okay. uh, who, you know, you can sort of show them either a working prototype or enough fidelity in what you're building that people go, huh, oh, yeah, there's probably you've proven this in customers maybe or, you know, you may have the, the product out there but it may not be generating revenue or they may not be ready to grow yet but it's kind of sort of that inkling of something. And then they sort of go through these, you know, and there's like, now there's like pre-seed, post-seed, yeah, yeah. pre-series A. And it's like, what the hell does that mean? Um, <laughs> yeah. And they're all, it's all very confusing. And yeah. ultimately it, it, it ends up the signaling, like what you call something yeah. is kind of indicates the type of people you're going to take money off. Okay. And those type of people have specific, usually specific, generally specific criteria they look for, yeah. for the companies they're backing. So a seed guy a seed investor is not necessarily looking for revenue that's tracking up to the right at a rapid clip they're like they're looking for is it a big market are you capable of doing this thing you know and taking a real punt on whether or not anyone will even like it sometimes yeah yeah and when you start getting through to the sort of series a series b it's very become very metric driven it's like ah uh, you're growing but not fast enough yes that becomes a real problem um yeah you know, I've got this saying that it's like if you're going to raise money, especially like beyond friends and family, yeah. you know, um, especially sort of post-seed, 
you're going to raise money post seed. It's like you either need an amazing story yeah. and amazing numbers yeah. um, or an amazing story and no numbers. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, like yeah. People will back. Yeah, right. They're like, oh, yeah, that seems amazing. Shut up and take my money. Yeah. And the minute you've got some numbers, they're like, oh, those numbers aren't right. And you're like, well, what's right? And like, I don't even know what right is, but that's yeah. not it. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, really yeah. hard to raise money after that. Yeah, wow. Crazy. And then is the end goal some sort of acquisition or an IPO? Yeah. I mean, a lot of companies get, you know, rolled up into other things. And it could yeah. be, you know, there's kind of, there's kind of two different types of acquisitions. There's the shit one and the good one. Um, okay. You know, the one where things aren't going particularly well, yeah. you really, it's really hard to raise money yeah. because all your charts have flattened out or they're not growing like you said they were or, you know, the market conditions have changed or something. Yeah. And you've built something that's great, but for some reason it's not growing like it used to. And, you know, when a, a competitor or adjacent come along and go, look, we'll take you, your IP is okay, your team's great, you know, we're not really adding anything to our top or bottom line here, but we'll take it. And that's kind of like called an aqua hire where it's like we'll uh, gobble up the team and, yeah. you know, you've got 10 devs. I can't hire 10 devs to save my life today, so I'll just buy you and pop them over there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And then there's the, the acquisition that happens because you're going really well. Yeah. Where you're actually a threat to someone else, and like, oh, that's you know, if we wait too much longer. This thing is going <laughs> to it's going to be impossible to buy it, or they're going to buy us, and we better do something about it. Um, and that's an interesting one, especially if you've got venture VC money inside you, because they're going to want you to keep pushing, right? And yeah. the balance between, oh, is, is this number they're going to acquire us for, which hopefully will be big because you're good, enough of a return, or because they want to do that, should we just push through and keep going? Yeah. Mm. And then an IPO, like there's very um there's not very many companies that actually end up IPOing really in the scheme mm. of things. Um you know, uh, especially Australian companies, yeah. The ASX is not necessarily the the most glamorous place to end up yeah. as a tech company because I think um as a cohort of investors on the ASX, Australian mums and dads are used to dividend paying, yeah, right. you know, Telstra's and BHP's and banks and <laughs> tech companies are generally in growth mode, which means they're not yielding anything out to their shareholders. The shareholders are there purely so the share price goes up. Yeah. Um, therefore, if you stick it in your in your pension fund, it's like, that's great, but, you know, I need to pay my bills. Where's my dividends? Um, yeah, so so like, not, there's a shape yeah. of investor that, that likes to buy this stuff. Yeah, it's definitely not the same um, mentality as the Nasdaq um, when uh, when the tech people are looking for a specific tech um, portfolio. That's right. Um, we've yeah. seen, so, yeah, yeah. So, um, so one of my one of the um, uh, VCs that I really like, Gary Tan, um, came from uh, Y Combinator and uh, started a company called um, Initialized Capital, I think it is. And uh, and he said that the companies that are growing their revenue four to five x are like his are like his A plus when he that's when he jumps in and they've got a market cap of. 10 million valuation of um, 10 million i mean um and uh, and so that's like that's kind of where he what his kind of entry point is and then when they're 3x they're kind of like his his b grade stuff and if it's like less than 2 um 2x he kind of turns away is that um are there any kind of specific early stage decision metrics that you like to look out for or um or are you like variable between each um decision or yeah is it a case by case basis or it's a case by case basis, um, you know. So I kind of wear two different hats. There's my angel investor hat, which mm. is very much an equity play, mm. and there's my attractive ventures hat, which is you know, lending to growing startups so the founders can retain mm. their own equity, right? They have to sell as many shares to to to, to, to sort of catalyze that growth. So the venture, the, the attractive ventures team is definitely on a different risk reward profile than a, a, the VC. If we talk about the equity position, the VC position, uh, it, it really does vary. Um, yeah. The the two metrics that most equity investors will look out for is, as you mentioned, growth as a percentage. Yeah. Um, you know, and the 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 floor of what's exciting, you know, is depending on the stage. Yeah. You know, is probably going to be a floor of a hundred percent if you're later stage, but as you said, three four hundred percent of your early stage. Oh. And the other um the other metric is um is net revenue retention. It's basically, do my customers pay me more over time? Yeah. Because right. if you can yeah. combine two things together, which is fast growth from new customers yeah. and growth over time from existing customers and you jam those two things together and, and you can keep those things above the floors and the floor for NRR is like 100%, right? You know, like if it's, if it's up at 110 or more, yeah. it's like, great. Our current customer base is expanding and we're pouring and we're growing really quickly. Yeah. Like, 
you know, any VC walking by and hears you mention that, you're like, what? What, what did you yeah. just say? Like, yeah. tell me more about that. So, uh, yeah, I, personally, it's it's all over the shop. And the earlier it is, the less likely those metrics are going to be real. Mm-hmm. It's easy to get 400% growth off 10 bucks, right? <laughs> it's hard to get it off 10 mil, right? Yeah, you know? 100%. That's yeah. good. So, you mentioned there uh, how Tractor differs. You just mentioned it very slightly. Could you delve into, I had a look on the website and it looked like there was kind of two things that uh, Tractor does sort of as their revenue model or whatever you want to call it. I'm assuming the first one is some sort of lending with, um, some interest um, mm-hmm. to, to founders. Uh, and then the next one was talking about warrants. Could you go into mm-hmm. how that works, maybe what a warrant is and if you've ever exercised it or how that could work in a situation for Tractor? Sure. So Tractor Ventures exists to help founders retain as much of their equity for as long as they want. So uh, every time you do, once you're on the VC track, you're basically selling a portion of your company to new investors every time you need more money to grow your company yeah. with the intent that you grow a very, very large company you end up with a much smaller percentage of it, but overall it's worth a fortune. Um, and VCs themselves will tell you they back 1% of founders, you know, so that, so that business model of that type of capital is useful for one in 100 founders, for argument's sake. Yeah. Um, we believe that, um, and, and and the analogy goes, I wrote a manifest which is called Rock, Rockets First Tractors, and the VCs <laughs> back the Rockets. So the Rockets are... They're very exciting. They're on yeah. huge missions, but they're expensive and they're complex yeah. and they're prone to blowing up. Yeah, um, right. You know, and that's the risk you take when you're yeah. building a rocket yeah. to go to Mars, right? It's like, man, there's a bunch are going to blow up and hopefully one will get there eventually. Yeah. Tractor Ventures was built to support, you know, the other founders that are building companies that aren't necessarily on the growth trajectory that the rockets are. Um yeah. That's not to say the founders aren't ambitious. That's not to say that the companies aren't important. Yeah. They're just not compatible with the venture capital business model. Yeah. So the way we do it is we do revenue-based financing, which is our first product, and we do advice, which is our second product. The way you pay for revenue-based financing is via a, a revenue share until you pay back our capital plus a fixed known amount. So, you know, we might be able to sell you a dollar for a dollar thirty. And you pay us back that dollar thirty over the next couple of years. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, yeah. If you got a, if you got a machine where you can drop a dollar in the top and two fall out the bottom, you know, in the space of two years, like you should pump as many as my dollars in as you can because That's you're cool. growing your business quite quickly yeah. and you're retaining all the shares. Yeah. Yeah. So you know, the idea for any founder is to grow your business because your your valuation is generally attached to your revenue. Yep. your recurring revenue, especially if you're a SaaS company. So the quicker that goes up, the bigger it is, the more valuable the company is, the more you probably want to retain. Yep. So that's the mechanics of revenue-based finance. Mm-hmm. You, We loan you some money. We take a small percentage, usually around 5% mm-hmm. of your top-line revenue until you pay it back plus a known multiple, mm-hmm. you know, 1.2 to 1.5, depending on things that we, our risk, our risk model that we run. Mm-hmm. And then the other part, is the advice. So we track their all exited founders yep. and our investors, of which there's 70 of them, are also right. founders. Um, some are current founders, some are exited founders, some of are so big they run family offices now and they've got squillions of dollars and, and they invest and they back tractor to back the founders that we back. So yep. um, the way that we mitigate risk by loaning to founders is by also helping them. And that's where we earn these warrants. So a warrant is ask is us earning the privilege, earning the, the right to buy some um, into the business at today's price sometime in the future. Oh, and it's right. usually got an end date of around five years or something like that. So for the next five years, we have the right to buy a small portion of your business yeah. at today's price yeah. in the future. So, you know, we write you a loan and, and we actually earn that over 12 months. So we've got a team. We basically do advice and strategy and help you yeah. put that money you borrowed from us to work so your company grows. Yeah. And we've got sort of a, a, a frozen in time today price of your of company to buy maybe 1% or 2% of the company. Okay. And then in theory, we'd only exercise it generally if they're selling the company or there's an opportunity to sell the shares. So we wouldn't buy them unless there was an opportunity to sell them straight away. So that could happen in one of two ways. They go off and raise some equity from a VC, right? And we could buy and sell it all in one shot. But hopefully we're buying it at a buck and selling it at five bucks, so we make a little bit of profit. Yeah. Or they get acquired and everyone's buying up all the shares. And we're like, ah, oh, we've got to exercise. We've got to turn those warrants, which oh, is an option yeah. to buy, into a share, and then that share gets sold straight away. Yeah. So it's 
it's the difference between you know and the way we make money on the loans is we we borrow money at a price or we lend it at a bigger price because we borrow it from people who don't want to deal with founders they're happy to deal with us because we borrow it in chunks of tens of millions yeah. and then we go and lend it out in chunks of hundreds of thousands yeah. you know yeah, and same yeah, as you yeah. divvy, up, divvy up anything when you divvy it up in a smaller bit you get to put your margin on it and that's yeah. how we run our business that's awesome. so the loans pay for our team yeah. and the equity over time will hopefully bring us lots of returns and the, as we grow a big book of track their revenue-based finance loans and helping founders over and over and hopefully they come back because we've helped them do it and they want to go again, then that's that's how our business works. It's pretty straightforward. So that's the right. venture business is, you know, invest $10 in 10 different companies and one of them might return 100 bucks, yeah. and eight, on, eight, eight of them might go to zero and be worth nothing, right? And those founders who are doing those companies are also have to go find something new to do. Yeah. We're a lending business, so we lend 10 bucks. Um, you know, we hope that nine and a half of them come back and come back with their their margins on top so our 10 bucks aren't going to turn into a thousand bucks so our return profile is less than a vc yeah. but there's also we take less risk you know the the founders who are paying us back are paying us before the equity holders are getting their returns right yeah. because they're paying us back every month as a portion of their revenue so there's a risk for every dollar that a founder takes in they must be really aware of the business model behind that dollar yeah. because that's the promise they're making right to the future in the future yeah. we're going to return a hundred for every dollar gives we, we think we can give them a hundred dollars back right but but i'd have to pay them in the meantime but when we get there it's going to be a lot in, in tractor's case it's like we're going to pay you a buck 30 for that buck over the next couple of years but the shares are all mine like oh, i'm going to retain the long-term value i didn't have to sell them to anyone to do that that's the difference between the two business models. That's the difference between why a founder would use some debt or equity. And up until recently in Australia, founders, basically you had to sell shares to get the capital in, to grow your business and hand off the value to the new shareholders, which is fine. Mm -hmm. And we believe that the future is actually a combination of both. Yeah. Is it if you're, if you're, you know, no company is highly, is going to run entirely on debt and no company is going to run entirely on equity. You know, there's a blend for both of them in there for most companies sort yeah. of going forwards. That's really cool. Thanks for explaining that. It's, it's uh, super informative. So uh, basically, we're wrapping. So um, thank you so much for your time. And Pleasure. it's actually been super informative. It's actually been really awesome. Um, yeah, it's been great, yeah. I just have like a final question. So like as Jed Bartlett, and I think your left forearm says, yep. what, what's next? Yeah, it says it on my, my, my left forearm. What's <laughs> next? Um, so I'm... Um, Super focused on building Tractor. Um, you know, we have a new product coming out uh, halfway through this year, I hope. I'm just starting to build it now. So my job my job as CEO of Tractor is really, really exciting. I get to build another product and I get to make sure we don't run out of money. Yeah. And I have an amazing team who does everything else, um, which is just delightful for me. And, and, and they're happy that I'm not up in their face, you know, when they're trying to do important things. So for us, for me, Tractor, we just want to be the place where founders come, um, you know, for their non-venture capital. So we've, we're building different products to help these founders, um, you know, grow really successful companies um, and hopefully we're there to help them along the way. Amazing. That's great. Yeah. And, um, and so where can, um, where can people find you for, yeah. um, for more info, for uh, more info about Tractor and yourself? And, yeah. Yep. So Tractor Ventures is at TractorVentures.com. Yep. Uh, I'm Matt Allen on Twitter. Yeah. Um, they're the two spots that'll get you all the information you need. I'll probably tweet too much, so if you need me, go over there. <laughs> I am on LinkedIn, but it's a bit of a bit of a dumpster fire over there. Yeah, so, yeah, um, yeah. I used to be a used to be a recruiter, so I said yes to everybody. And now it's, it's not good. <laughs> too many connections. Yeah, I too get many that. connections. And quality <laughs> down, quality in in near bad. Yeah. Um, okay, Matt. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Matt. Yeah. Um, I think we're done. But yeah, Pleasure. I mean, it's Thanks been so good. Me. Hopefully, you found it a little bit enjoyable. I don't know. Indeed. Thanks very much, guys. All right. Thank you so much.